Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitis. Today is September 18th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. Yesterday was the U.S. Constitution Day. Today is Fed Day. The Federal Reserve concluded their meeting, and the Federal Reserve lowered the target range for the federal funds rate to 1.75 to 2% on a 7 to 3 vote, but offered few signals on the next move. It was the second rate cut this year amid global trade and growth concerns and muted inflation pressures. Policymakers' projections for the economy were little changed, with growth seen at a slightly higher 2.2% this year and at 2% through 2020. I am taking this headline from Trading Economics. I happen to disagree with the comment that the Federal Reserve offered few signals on the next move. I am of the belief that the Federal Reserve will continue cutting interest rates throughout this year and probably into 2020 as well because we imagine that the fundamental underlying economic data will continue to deteriorate, if not in the United States, around the world. And so we are not an island unto ourselves here in the United States of America. Those things will make their way here as they have been and they will continue to do so. On top of that, there are mounting, mounting geopolitical risks from all four corners of the world and anything could erupt at any moment. There are also a whole bunch of black swan events, things that can come out of left field, right field that nobody's paying attention to. One of those things I think uh, transpired this week already and that had to do with the repo market, the short-term interest rates getting out of hand and actually getting higher, going higher than the federal funds rate. So the market was pretty much dictating where the Federal Reserve moved and it caused the Federal Reserve to act swiftly to inject the system with tens of billions of dollars on an overnight basis to keep the system moving. Now we're going to get to all of that, but uh, it's interesting to note that this was a vote of seven to three, so this was not unanimous. There were people who said, no, we got to continue to hold rates and we'll just continue to see what happens. We did our insurance cut back at the end of July. Stock market is near or at all-time highs. 3.7% unemployment rate, a 50-year low or near it. Inflation is at target or getting a lot closer to it. So given those data points, there's not a lot of reasoning for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. Now, during Chairman Powell's press conference, which lasted about an hour, he took obviously a handful of questions from the reporters. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and this is in regards to the repo market, and we talked about this briefly yesterday, was that this had to do with corporate taxes being due, and so firms needed money. They needed money so they could transfer cash, so they needed the cash, and that U.S. Treasuries came due, and so they needed to be paid out. The people were calling in their Treasury bonds. They needed the cash, right? $54 billion. $54 billion. This is nothing. This is nothing. And this is why I said yesterday, this is something that we have to pay attention to and monitor as much as we can here, because that's the story. It has to do with corporate taxes being due and U.S. Treasuries that came due, and so they needed the cash, okay? If $54 billion caused an event like this to occur, which has not happened since the Great Recession, since the run-up to the Great Recession, uh, we got a problem, because... $54 billion is nothing. We have $23 trillion in debt floating out there. Now, of course, a lot of it, you know, different durations. But $54 billion is nothing. It's nothing. It's a drop in a big, big bucket. Okay, so if this gets out of hand, or if this is a large corporation, if this happens to be GE, and don't forget about General Electric. We just talked about it, what, about a month ago, uh, where you had Harry Markopoulos, the forensic accountant, come out and say, look, we've looked at these books, and something ain't right. And we're filing paperwork, we're filing basically a, a complaint against the company to the federal government saying, look, you got to look into these guys, basically being an external whistleblower, that they're cooking their books. And what did he tell us? He said, well, this could be larger than WorldCom and Enron combined. And if history is any indicator, once allegations of accounting fraud were made known to the public, both of those companies were out of business. They were bankrupt in four months. So I'm not saying that this is General Electric. We can stick with what Jay Powell told us, that this had to do with corporate taxes being due and U.S. Treasuries that came due, and so the cash was needed. But the cash wasn't there, and it was only $54 billion. Now, that's nothing to sneeze at, but when you've been printing money 
at $50 billion a clip, at a clip a month. That was quantitative easing, and now you have to do it on an overnight basis? you got a problem. And this can get out of hand very quickly. And we've had conversations many times here on this podcast, and this is also something that we have highlighted in our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing, several years ago. We said, what happens if the market says enough's enough? What happens if interest rates have a mind of their own? That is to say that they are no longer going to take their marching orders from the Federal Reserve. That the marketplace says, "Uh uh-uh, something smells fishy here. Something is not right. $23 trillion in debt, no end in sight, trillion-dollar deficits, endless wars. Uh, You're going to have to pay us more than 1.7%. You're going to have to pay us more than 2.2%. And if that starts to happen, the Federal Reserve is not going to be able to keep up. And this is exactly what we said in our recent video that we posted on the CapitalNews.com and our YouTube channel, The Capital News, are central banks trapped. And we focused on quantitative easing and interest rate policy surrounding the ECB, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the BOJ, and the Federal Reserve. And we said, just look at these graphs, see if they make sense. We showed you QE1, quantitative easing 2, operation twist, and then quantitative easing 3, focusing here on the Federal Reserve. And we said, look, if the Federal Reserve has to get back in these markets and continue to inject liquidity because of the laws of diminishing marginal returns, they are going to have to go hyperbolic, which they already have. But they are going to have to really put the pedal to the metal if they have to come back in and quote-unquote save the system and inject liquidity back in to keep these systems floating. Because that's exactly what is going to end up happening. And it is going to be on a magnitude that we can't even imagine. It's going to be trillions and trillions of dollars. Because you have to recall, if you have not taken the time to look at that video, I do ask that you do, And you have to understand the history of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet because that's where this takes place. It's an expansion of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, quantitative easing. Up until the great financial crisis, we were below $1 trillion as far as the Fed's balance sheet was concerned. It was about $800 billion, okay, $800 billion. It took 100 years for the Fed's balance sheet to get to $800 billion, okay? Almost overnight, boom, it started increasing in trillion-dollar increments. It went up so high to four and a half trillion. Okay, this was the monetary experiment that we have been undergoing for the past decade. All right, zero interest rate policy here in the United States, quantitative easing, negative interest rate policy in Europe, in Japan, and also their versions of QE, which the ECB just announced last week, that they are going to be continuing their QE program after halting it for nine months, which tells you that this thing has no credibility, it has no validity, but they are going to continue to do it because this is their tool. They're a carpenter with a hammer and a drill. That's all they know how to do. And that is what they're going to continue to do because that's that's it. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough political will for fiscal stimulus. And we don't need it. Uh, everybody is oversaturated. Everybody is over leveraged. So if you understand what I'm saying here, quantitative easing, this decades-long monetary experiment is going to come crashing down because it's built on a foundation of sand. It isn't real. It's money printing. It's just, let's just keep this thing going. Let's just keep it going. Let's just keep it going. There is no leadership anywhere. Nobody wants to look at you in the face and say, look, we've made a mistake. This is not right. But they're never going to do that. They're just going to dig in deeper. They're going to double down. They're going to triple down. And they're going to continue with these policies. That's why I tell you every day, stay diversified and stay vigilant. Because you cannot be all in stocks, all in bonds, all in, you know, you got to have your precious metals. You got to have a little bit of everything. You got to have cash on the sidelines waiting to take advantage of what I think is going to be the sell and the opportunity of a lifetime. Because any type of company that exists, that is publicly traded, they must have been doing something right if they're going to survive what I think is going to happen. Because I think it's going to be quite the doozy. And if 50, and again, if $54 billion can rock the boat to the degree that it did, look out. This, this, is, this is a foreshock. There were four shocks before the Great Recession. There's four shocks before this one. We talk about them here on a daily basis. This is the business cycle, folks. The ebbs and flows of life, the ebbs and flows of the economy. It doesn't matter who's sitting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It does not matter if he's a Republican or a Democrat. These things happen, okay? And when you have a recession, it is a healthy process. It is supposed to get rid of the malinvestment. The problem is we have politicians and central bankers who don't want to take responsibility for anything, so they just want to continually and perpetually kick the can down the road as far as they possibly can. 
But who's going to have to pay the piper at the end of the day? You and me. So a little history lesson. We had the subprime crisis in the Great Recession. We had a liquidity crunch, which is akin to this $54 billion hiccup, which is really the whole, the whole system, trust and confidence and liquidity. If you have no liquidity, you have no system. That's what it's built on. So you had then chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, come out and say, look, subprime, when he was asked a question, subprime is contained. It's such a small portion of the overall housing market and therefore such a small subset of the overall economy that it's contained and it's not going to spread and it's not going to cause any problems. Well, wouldn't you know today in answering this question about the repo market and this $54 billion that Jay Powell, our current chairman of the Federal Reserve, said this is contained? He said it's contained. I told you. History may not repeat, but it certainly rhymes as Mark Twain tells us. So again, this is something that we're going to keep our eye on very closely because this is one of those things that comes out of the woodwork. It's a liquidity squeeze. Now, if you continue, if if markets should continue to have a mind of their own, which is what we were sort of talking about last Friday, is, is there trouble in the bond market? So if rates start to continue to go up, despite the Federal Reserve trying to uh, physically, basically, uh, through their monetary tools, lower them, or through jawboning and say, yeah, we're going to continue to do what it takes to, ke- to continue this expansion, and, and the market says, no, nah, we're not buying it, they got a problem. Because there was nothing in the statement today during Jay Powell's press conference that said, we're going to be- begin quantitative easing anytime soon. He did actually take a question on negative interest rates, and he said, we, we don't foresee any type of uh, policy that's going to get us to negative territory. Uh, anytime soon. He sort of brushed that off, which is a good thing. We don't want it, despite the fact that Thunder Thumbs is tweeting about it, that he wants negative interest rates in this country. We don't need it. We don't want it. It's not good. It does not work for Europe. It does not work for Japan. We do not need to import that nonsense here. we got enough nonsense to deal with. We don't need that craziness on top of all of it. And of course, Thunder Thumbs did take to Twitter after the decision. And of course, he was not happy because they did not cut interest rates down to zero, and they did not begin quantitative easing. They cut them by 25 basis points when the president was looking for 200 basis points to take them down to zero. So not even close. Again, this is the sidestepping of Donald Trump because he wants to wash his hands of the economy that he wants to both own and disown if it goes south, and he wants to blame it on the Federal Reserve. He may also want to blame it on the Chinese with this U.S.-China trade deal and trade war or whatever, and he may also start to blame U.S. companies themselves because we've already seen him do that on Twitter as well, which I called, and I thought that was pretty much a, a breakdown of his, amongst other things, but that was just poor policy to come out as the president of the United States and to blame U.S. companies for complaining about tariffs that the president and his administration have enacted. So I didn't think that was kosher, but that's what he does. He will deflect. He will not take responsibility. As far as I'm concerned, that's poor leadership. He'll take, he'll take credit for all things that look good. Anything that looks bad, it's somebody else's fault. We need to do better than that here. So that was, sort of, that, that was, that was the Federal Reserve's decision. Uh, look, we're not surprised. We were anticipating 25 basis point cut, especially after what happened in the overnight lending market. Uh, And I anticipate that the Federal Reserve will continue on an easing cycle. It doesn't mean that they're going to do it every month, but they are going to, we're going to go lower before we go higher. Let's put it that way, okay? And their estimation here for 2.2% GDP growth this year and 2% through 2020, uh uh-uh, I don't think so. Especially not the 2% through 2020. I just don't think that's going to happen. There would have to be so many things that turned around, and there is just nothing in the data that is suggesting that to me. Although we have had some mixed data points recently, uh, but still there is still further deterioration and things are still unfolding. Again, folks, I am not wishing for a recession, but look, we've had a decade of this monetary experiment globally that does not work. We have households that have too much debt. we got corporations that, who, that have too much debt governments that have too much debt. And now the question is, well, who's going to bail all these people out? Because in the subprime crisis, we bailed out Wall Street, which we never should have done, but we did it. $800 billion in taxpayer dollars, if not more, and then trillions and trillions of dollars from the Federal Reserve to these guys. And we're never going to know that total number. Believe me when I tell you, we'll never know that complete number. And we even gave money to international institutions as well. So your hard-earned dollars didn't only go out to bail out Wall Street, they went to bail out other banks and corporations 
all over the world. Now, how many of you knew that? So I have to give credit where credit's due because I'll tell you who attacked uh, Ben Bernanke at the time was Senator Bernie Sanders. I have to give Bernie Sanders credit on that. He went after uh, Ben Bernanke pretty hard, pretty hard. And Ben Bernanke covered himself because he said, I'm not going to answer your question as to where all that money went because I can hide behind bank secrecy laws. Bank secrecy laws, these are real. This was Ben Bernanke's answer. He doesn't have to answer the question. He didn't. He didn't answer the question when he was pressed by Senator Sanders, where did the money go? It's our money. Where did it go? No, not going to answer it. And he didn't. That's who we're dealing with. You understand why I'm saying to end the Federal Reserve? There's no accountability. They can come out like Jay Powell did once again, his opening remark, the Federal Reserve works for the American people. Yeah, really, Jay, who? What Americans? Not people who are trying to save, not people who are trying to, uh, who, who live on a fixed income, not people who are close to retirement, not th none of these people. The other thing that I thought was ridiculous from him, from his mouth this afternoon, which is no surprise, he's a central banker. He said, well, we think this policy makes sense to inject liquidity into the system, to lower interest rates, because as it makes its way through the channels and through various systems, prices will go higher. Oh, fantastic, because everybody goes shopping for higher prices. Hey, honey, we got a, di we got a coupon here, and the price is 10% higher. Get it? I mean, that is the logic and the rationale from the Federal Reserve. They want higher prices. But they said, well, you know, your payment might go down uh, because, you know, you're going to borrow so much more money now, but your payment might go down because interest rates are lower. I'd rather the price of the asset be lower. I'd rather it be at a fair value, not at these inflated values. This is, this is why you have such income inequality. We have not seen in generations. So this is, I hope this is all making sense to everybody and, and why I am so adamantly against the Federal Reserve, why we have to abolish it and why we have to abolish the federal income tax with it. How did the markets respond? Well, they whipsawed, which is par for the course on Fed Day. We had the S&P close up one point. The Dow gained 36. The NASDAQ lost nine. And the Russell 2000 shed 10 points for the day. The Dow Jones Transports lost 1.2%. The New York Stock Exchange was relatively flat, but slightly in the red. WTI pretty much unchanged from yesterday's podcast, $58 a barrel. Brent, the international metric is at $63.70, slightly down. Gold, $1,493 an ounce. Silver, $17.68 an ounce. Still believe that we are in the midst of a bull market when it comes to the precious metals. Any type of pullback, as far as I'm concerned, is a buying opportunity. Now, the other thing that we've mentioned before here, and I will reiterate it here again, and we'll do so on future podcasts. When we have real negative interest rates, precious metals will outperform. When we have real negative interest rates, precious metals will outperform. That's the nature of them. It's just how they operate, okay? And it makes sense once you think about it, and we've gone through that calculus before, and we'll go through it again on subsequent podcasts, but that's just something to be mindful of. And when you have Europe going deeper into negative territory, when you have Japan in negative territory, and we are going to get, the, the, they're expecting to go deeper into negative territory, and when you have our interest rates, which are almost at real negative interest rates because you got to take the nominal rate, which right now, as far as the Fed funds rate is concerned, we're at, let's just call it 2%. But now you have to subtract out inflation, okay? Well, we just got inflation. It was 2.4. So 2 minus 2.4 is negative 0.4. So we have them here. It is a negative real interest rate. It is not good, folks. It's not good at all. But this is what they're doing. We have the U.S. 10-year Treasury down slightly a little bit, again, flocking to safe havens. So we have the yield now at 1.78%, 1.78%. The VIX, the Volatility Index, lost 3% and is now at $13.95, something else to be mindful of. Which we told you, anytime it gets around 15, which is the average, below 14, now you really got to start paying attention, and now it's at $13.95. So is, what's the market going to do? Are they going to continue to buy what the Fed's selling? Or are they going to say, uh, you know, a lot of this was already priced in. We knew they were going to cut 25 basis points. Now it's buy the rumor, sell the fact. But the other thing we got to be mindful of is tomorrow is Thursday, and this is the first day when the U.S. trade delegation and the Chinese trade delegation start to talk once again in Washington, D.C. Now, of course, these are lower-level talks, but nevertheless, expect some sort of headline where everything is fantastic. On the Dow Jones transports, like I said, they lost 1.2%, and we said this yesterday, FedEx and after-hours trading 
was down about 10%. Well, they closed down 13% during the cash trade today. 13% loss for the day. Okay? That's nothing to sneeze at. Lower guidance. All right? Lower guidance. No surprise to us here. The other thing that we've been talking about, and I actually saw an article on CNN today. They talked about U.S. Steel and how they're, how they're down significantly and how they're down also today because they reported and they're giving negative forward guidance due to primarily lower prices and softening demand, especially in Europe. But what have we been saying here for weeks, if not months? You know, this whole tariff war, this whole trade war is a bunch of shenanigans, and it ends up causing the very problem that you're trying to solve, which is so common when it comes to governmental policies and intervention, which is why the government has to get out of it. They have to get out of it. And again, that's another reason why I say abolish the federal, or the, uh, well, yeah, the Federal Reserve, but also the, the federal income tax, because if they don't have the money, they can't, they can't dictate as to where it goes, because it's not in their hands. So you got to starve the beast. So you have these tariffs, and we've talked about this before because this is Econ 101. You got the tariffs that come on. Okay, now you got higher domestic prices. What does the law of supply tell us? You got higher prices, you're going to have producers who are going to want to exploit that, and so they're going to start producing more. Well, that's exactly what happened. They started producing more. And then you have uh, you have uh, Donald Trump going all over the place, flying around, saying, look, this steel, this steel mill is opening up. This one's opening up. I told you this was going to happen. Everybody loves me, right? That's right. Because that's exactly what happened. But what happens when you build up supply and your demand is not there? Prices start to come back down. And what happens when prices start to come back down and the share prices fall and the margins start getting squeezed? You start laying people off and you start shutting down those very plants that you just opened, which is exactly what happened. And a lot of these plants that the U.S. Steel in particular has closed down is in the state of Michigan and Indiana. Now, Indiana, politically speaking, might be a lock for Donald Trump. It's a pretty red state, but you don't, but you never know. But Michigan was a blue state, but it crossed the line for Donald Trump in 2016. Okay, if you continue to have this tariff war, this trade war on, and you continue to have farmers filing for bankruptcy and being more and more delinquent on their debt payments, and you have manufacturing continuing to close down plants or not bring people back on, you're going to have a problem politically speaking. Okay, now he can try to point the finger at the Federal Reserve all he wants. This is directly linked to the tariff situation in this trade war. Okay, so it's not good. And this is just economic 101. I'm not trying to pick on the president, but I do not like this policy. And all you got to do is think about it. You got a higher price, they start supplying more. But you didn't have the demand. So now the prices are going to start to collapse, and that's what we've seen. And now you have U.S. Steel giving negative forward guidance and continuing to talk about slower growth in Europe, despite the fact that the ECB is going deeper into negative territory and is going to start printing 20 billion euros a month indefinitely. It's not good, folks. That's not good at all. On the political front, we have Secretary of State Mike Pompeo over in Saudi Arabia. Well, guess what? Iran did it. It's an act of war. And now he's over there trying to build a consensus or an alliance or whatever you want to call it. And we have the president ordering Secretary of the Treasury, Steven Mnuchin, to escalate the sanctions against the Iranians. Now, look, folks, anytime we've seen this in the past, when we have the United States attempting to build consensus, to, attempting to build an alliance, we unfortunately end up going to war. Now, I really hope and pray that we don't. Again, this podcast is about peace and prosperity, the truth where we can find it, and free market capitalism. We don't want war. We don't need war. This was oil. This is stuff that bubbles up out of the ground. You know, some steel got mangled and blown up. We do not need to send people over there to die for this. We just don't need to do it. We can't afford it, nor should we want to do it. Now, look, these sanctions in and of themselves can be viewed as an act of war from the perspective of the Iranian, by the Iranian regime. And if they feel that they are boxed into a corner, then they might react. Which I imagine, if the United States had sanctions on us, we would react, we would respond, we wouldn't be too kind about it either. If 80% of our exports were halted, were, were just fell off a cliff, they're not making it out into the, the global market, I'm sure there'd be a lot of upset people in the United States demanding action from their government, and rightly so. Now, this is what we're doing. Now, 
There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that none of us are privy to. I'm certainly not. Uh, but we do know that we had the Iranian nuclear deal, and the Europeans were fine with it. The Iranians seemed to be kosher with it. And at the time, the, that, the, the Obama administration was okay with it. No, I'm not for sending the $150 billion over there, dollars and euros. No, I'm not for that at all. But if you had an agreement where the Iranians were going to remain in compliance, you could have people over there inspecting their sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now we revoked ourselves unilaterally, unilaterally from that deal, the United States, and now we have this chaos. It's not good. The one thing that I am clinging to, and it's hope, and like I always say here, hope is not a strategy, but so far, Donald Trump has not taken us to war. Not that he can, actually. I mean, it's actually the Congress who's supposed to vote to declare war, but I mean, we're so far removed from that, it's ridiculous. But nevertheless, he's had ample opportunity to take us to war or to react militarily. Maybe not war, but, you know, doing something sending some fighter bombers, some fighter jets over there, doing something. He has not done it yet, and I hope he does it. But, you know, so many things are out of the president's control. You know, God forbid an American citizen or, you know, or military, because we have so many military personnel over there right now, God forbid one of them gets injured or killed. The president's hand is going to be forced. The president's hand will be forced, and he will have to retaliate in some way, shape, or form. So, this could be something that turns into a hot war very quickly. And we do have the United Nations General Assembly, General Assembly taking place at the end of this month. Perhaps, I don't know, a coalition will be, will be had by then, or maybe cooler heads will prevail, and there can be some sort of solution, if anything, temporary. We just don't want this to be a hot-blooded war because we can't afford it. $23 trillion in debt. We're still in Afghanistan. Iraq is still a mess staging coups in, in Venezuela. We're all over the place. We can't do it. We can't do it. And that ties in with what we just talked about earlier. Liquidity. How, how many bonds are we going to issue? And once they start coming due, is there going to be the money to do it? Are we going to have a dollar shortage? And then everything's just going to be squeezed and pinched. So it, it's all connected. That's why we talk about everything here. And I hope it all starts to make sense. Because there's so many data points out there. There's so many headlines. There's so much noise. But you just got to take a deep breath, sit down, put this economic puzzle together, put this geopolitical puzzle together, and connect the dots and paint the picture. And I hope I'm doing a good job at that. If I'm not, it's up to you to keep me in check. Send me comments. I love hearing from you. And I'm going to wrap this podcast up for this evening. And thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure having you as always. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, and leave those comments. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.